first uh, internal workshop, the motivation was quite clear because in the IEEE conference, Thorsten gave tutorial and there was quite a lot of UNSW people there. So we thought that there is no point to fly all the students to US just to hear Thorsten. Uh, so let's bring Thorsten here. Uh, so we build a day that focus on characterization. If that will be successful, we will try to do different topics. And the idea is to have one day that we f bring the best people here that speak about uh, topic. We will have six or seven like that, and we run that, that in three years of PhD, you will get the option to hear all the people. So today mm. we start with Thorsten uh, on TL, and we have no better person for that. And then we will have very interesting combination between Ned and Ivan. Uh, so it will be theoretical and practical work on uh, optical medium. Then we have Albert that uh, will speak about uh, CL. And then we have Hannah and uh, Jay that will have a uh, short presentation on two powerful tools that we don't use so often here. So we saw that that would be a good idea for you to know them. Uh, we have two coffee breaks. So there will be coffee break here uh, with fruits and cakes. And there will be lunch break that uh, hopefully will help you to recover after all the knowledge that you will get in the morning. Well, are we ready? Where you need to focus. But Thorsten is always in focus. Yes. Sure. So by definition. <laughs> he is the focus. <laughs> yeah, the definition of focus is yeah. where Thorsten is here. Uh, yeah? Okay. So I will we will not have a long in, uh, introduction, A, because you know most of the people, B, just because we don't have a lot of time. But Thorsten, I assume that all of you know, uh, is the guy that some people call the father of TL or the mother mm -hmm. of TL. It depends how you define Rob according to that. But I think that we agree that you are the father and he is the mother, no? That yes. was the... Yeah. Yes. Uh, so PL imaging was quite, uh, we can say that was invented here 10 years ago. Um, a lot of activities, a lot of parameters that you can extract with these techniques. Very successful company that was uh, spinning off from this one. Uh, so Thorsten will speak, I think, more on the theory this time? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's welcome Thorsten. <laughs> oh, thanks, Steve, uh, for the opportunity. And thanks, everyone, for showing up here at 9 o'clock, despite the somewhat uh, boring title. And that's what I, why I thought maybe I'll suggest a more interesting title. What I really want to talk about is why luminescence characterization or the luminescence principle is such an awesome technique and why it is so useful. Um, there's a couple of people here from my research group who I don't think I have to convince, but some of you might not know uh, about the sort of really the revolution that has happened over the last 10, 12 years in uh, the characterization of silicon devices and how luminescence is now very broadly applied for that. And the talk I'm going to give here is essentially a cut-down version of a slide that, that I presented, as they've said, as, uh, at the IEEE conference earlier this year in a tutorial. And that tutorial was um, set up as a two-part presentation, which was presented by Martin Schubert from Fraunhofer Ether, shown here on the right, um, and myself. And the talk was, was sort of structured in, a, in, in two sections. I presented more the theoretical side of things and the motivation for why luminescence is such a good technique, and he focused more on the experimental side of things. And I will talk about the first part of this presentation here today, and maybe in a subsequent seminar or uh, some later days, if we can, we, we can talk more about the ex actual experimental uh, um, realities of, of, of luminescence characterization. So as Ziv said, I'm a prof professor here at UNSW. I run a small research team together with Ziv. Actually, we have a very nice group. Um, working on all, all aspects of luminescence characterization. And uh, yeah, as they've mentioned, I'm also co-founder of a company. We're now about 25, 30 people, um, most of them here in Sydney, and we're building inspection systems and characterization tools for R&D labs around the world and also for, uh, for high-volume manufacturing. And two of our tools are actually here on campus, one at SURF and one here in the characterization lab upstairs. If you have any questions on any of this, um, feel free to contact myself or Ziff or any other, other member of our, our group. Um, I'm sure they'd be happy to take you to the labs and show you some of the experimental systems um, if you're interested. So I thought as an introduction to this presentation, it would be a good idea to talk about 
why characterization in general is such an important topic. Um, this whole workshop is on characterization techniques. And all of you are working on solar cells in different uh, uh, capacities, I guess. But all of you understand how hard it is to make an efficient solar cell and how to process an efficient solar cell. And that is because it is a complex topic. It is a very multidisciplinary challenge involving a whole range of aspects, material science, simulations, process engineering, device physics, and process monitoring and characterization, and probably a whole lot more that I've forgotten here. But the kind, kind of point I want to uh, drive home here is that characterization and, and process monitoring is at the core of everything we do. Uh, and there's a close interplay between characterization and any of these other aspects. If you take, for example, simulation, you can't do simulations if you don't have experimental data to base your simulations on. On the other hand, simulations can be used to validate experimental results. And so there's a very close interplay between those two. Yeah? We do a simulation, we try to validate it with experiments, then we do experiments and we see experimental results which are not actually uh, included in our simulation and that in turn allows us to improve our simulations and so forth. So this is the principle between characterization all these different aspects. We can validate our current understanding but we also often have new findings which, which then um, improve uh, whatever device physics, material science, process engineering or simulation. And of course the reality is a lot more complex than this. The only point that I try to make here is that characterization is really at the core of everything you do in solar cell processing and therefore it's a great topic to work on because it allows you to gain a relatively deep understanding of all these different aspects. The other question I wanted to address is why do we need spatially resolved characterization in, uh, in PV? As you all know, a typical solar cell is a relatively large area device, 6 inch by 6 inch, so it's about this size. And solar cell processing has a wide range of pitfalls, um, which means that in typical solar cells we have a very large uh, range of variations that occur spatially within a device. And what I've tried to do here on this slide is to um, structure these or group these different uh, variations into three categories. The first one is shown at the bottom left. These are the device-related um, variations. So in this picture you see a photoluminescence image taken under open circuit conditions of a sort of older style screen printed solar cell. You can see it has only two bus bars. Um, yes. Um, modern solar cells have more like three, four, or up to five bus bars these days. But you can see on the top and on the left, I've plotted a cross-section through the luminescence intensity here. In the horizontal cross-section, you see these little wiggles, the periodic pattern of up and down in the luminescence intensity, which is related to the periodic pattern of grid fingers. In the vertical direction, we have a pattern with this parabolic shape here between the bus bars, which of course is related to the presence of the bus bars. And even if you had a perfect wafer, if you had a perfectly uniform wafer, if you had a perfect process, you would still see those variations which are inherently uh, associated with this specific device structure. So there's nothing you can do about it except improving your device structure and making a different device which, which avoids these variations. Then there are the processing variations. And there's two examples here, one very old one where people here at UNSW had actually intentionally put fingerprints on the wafer prior to the diffusion. But you see there's a whole range of little black dots, black lines, and all these black spots represent uh, recombination active sites in the wafer which are due to a whole range of different causes. It can be processing related scratches, um, crystallographic defects, or, or, and so forth. On the left hand side here, this is a solar cell which has a very uh, severe problem with serious resistance in this area, which is why this appears bright in this area. We'll talk about that later on. You also see a whole range of white strips in this image and this is due to broken fingers. So these are called processing related variations, problems with the screen printing, pro problems with the diffusion, problem with the firing. All these can lead to these uh, spatially resolved problems that we need to learn about. And finally we have material related variations in a silicon solar cell. On the right hand side here you see a multi-crystalline solar cell and you can see it has this dark edge here at the top and this is because this is a wafer that was cut from an, a so-called edge brick the edge bricks are located in close proximity to the crucible during the crystallization of the silicon and impurities can actually diffuse into the material during the um, solid phase of that, uh, that process which reduces the minority carrier lifetime in that region and as you can see has a very detrimental effect on the solar cell in this case. 
In this example here, the grayscale image, I will blow that up here for you. You can see, again, we have a whole range of patterns here. These are crystallographic uh, so-called dislocation defects, which reduce the minority curl lifetime. But you can also see all these little dark blobs in this, in this image, which in this case are caused by local shunts. The shunt is a local short circuit of the junction. In this case, caused by material induced uh, shunts caused by um, so-called inclusions. You have silicon nitride, silicon carbide inclusions, which are conductive, which short the junction locally. And that's what's causing those uh, patterns in the luminescence image. So you can see there's a whole variety of reasons why your solar cell is non-uniform. And that's why we need imaging techniques to find out about these uh, problems and to mitigate them and to make better solar cells. So that was basically just the introduction um, to explain why we need characterization, why characterization is important, and why we need um, imaging techniques. So now um, I'll talk about the more fundamental aspects on why luminescence is such a cool technique. And in the first part of that, I will talk to you about the exponential nature of the IV curve. And I will show you that the fundamental reason why we have an exponential IV curve has nothing to do with a PN junction. It is just a basic fundamental property of a uniform wafer. I'm not sure if everyone is completely on board with that concept. I would think that some of you should be surprised about that because the way this is normally taught is you learn about the uh, derivation of the IV curve by using drift currents and diffusion currents and how they combine to form the, um, the exponential nature of the IV curve due to the reduction of potential barriers in a PN junction and so on. And what I want to show you today, that this is all not true, that fundamentally the IV curve is just related to the um, dependence of recombination on the splitting of the quasi-Fermi levels. Oh, sorry. Yes, so after that, um, I will show you the close relation between luminescence and voltage and how we can use luminescence as a contactless probe for the voltage and how that can be used. And then finally, how we can use luminescence to measure the excess carrier density, which is the basis for, uh, for the luminescence-based lifetime measurements. And if I have time in the end, I will also talk about the role of so-called voltage-independent carriers. We'll see. <coughs> so let's have a look at what happens in a... I hope this is not too basic for you guys. Uh, I wasn't sure how much, uh, what your background was, but let's look at this illuminated semiconductor. Um, the sketch here on the, on the bottom shows the energy diagram, the energy levels for electrons uh, on the y-axis. The sort of slightly gray shaded regions represent the conduction band and the valence band with the conduction band edge shown here and the valence band edge shown here. And we are assuming we have an intrinsic semiconductor, so the Fermi energy is located in the middle of the band gap. And as you know, the Fermi energy is a quantity associated with a Fermi distribution and the Fermi distribution is the probability for electron states to be occupied and it is that distribution which actually minimizes the free energy in the, um, in the semiconductor. So on the left hand side we show what's happening in the dark. There's a very small number of electrons in the conduction band, very large number in the valence band. And now we assume that we have the sun and we turn it on at t equals zero. Then we get the scenario shown in the middle. You see here at the bottom, we have 10 to the minus 14 seconds, so this is 10 femtoseconds. So we're looking at what happens in the semiconductor very, very shortly after the light has been turned on. 10 to the minus 14 seconds is much shorter than the time that is needed for the carriers to thermalize within the bands. And that is represented here by the green lines, where you've seen we have a very large concentration of electrons at very high energy states and a lot of holes here at the bottom of the valence band. And these very broad energy distributions represent or reflect the sort of um, very broad spectrum of sunlight, which contains a lot of high energy photons. Now what happens in the semiconductor is that within about 10 to the minus 12 seconds or within one picoseconds, the electrons and the holes scatter with phonons. The phonons represent the temperature of the lattice, which is room temperature. So within 10 to the minus 12 seconds, all the electrons in the conduction band and all the holes in the valence band resume thermal distributions, which means the distributions push much closer to the, the band edges, represented here by the yellow lines. So in that case, we have thermal distribution of electrons in the conduction band and a thermal distribution of the electrons in the valence band, but we still have a lot more electrons in the conduction band than we have in the dark in electrochemical equilibrium. So in a sense, you could say we have complete thermal equilibrium in this scenario, 
but we do not have an e electrochemical equilibrium because there's this discrepancy in the carrier densities between uh, the illuminated and the dark haze. And that is described in theory by two so-called quasi-Fermi energies. Yeah? Each band has its own Fermi distribution, a thermal distribution where the free energy is minimized for all the electrons in the conduction band and separately for the valence band. And each Fermi distribution has its own Fermi energy, which is called a quasi-Fermi energy. And these two quasi-Fermi energies are shown here as, red, uh, uh, as yellow dashed lines. And the difference between those two quasi-Fermi energies is one of the key aspects of luminescence. And you need to understand that this is one of the most important parameters in this talk, in the description of um, luminescence and in the understanding what the voltage of a solar cell actually is. And the more carriers we have in the, elect in the conduction band, the more carriers we have in the valence band, the more holes we have in the valence band, the larger the separation of the quasi-Fermi energies will be. Now, again, I would like to refer you to this book by Peter Werfel, Physics of Solar Cells, shown here at the bottom. Um, a lot of what I'm talking about is derived from that book, and if you haven't got that book or you haven't read it, I strongly encourage you to do so. Yeah? I'm not getting a commission for, uh, for, for this, but uh, it is really a great book, and it gives you a, a very nice and rather different perspective on the fundamental um, principle of how a solar cell works, and uh, that sort of different perspective can be quite useful in, in whatever you do, I believe. Um, so from that, we take that the separation of the Fermi levels and that is something you need to believe me, it, is, it comes from this analysis that Peter Wurfel has done. The separation of the Fermi levels is actually representing the free energy of the electron hole pair. Or in other words, it is the, the free energy that ele electrons gain when they go the con to the conduction band over the free energy that they have when they're in the valence band. Now, these electrons which are in the conductance band, they can do two things in a solar cell. They can either transition back to the valence band via the external circuit or they can go back to the valence band internally which is called recombination. In the later process the free energy is wasted either in the form of heat or in the form of an emitted photon. In a solar cell what we obviously try to do is that the electron transition from the conduction band to the valence band is associated with a transfer of that extra free energy to a consumer. So that separation of the Fermi levels, that free energy difference is the amount of energy that an electron can supply to a consumer in an external circuit. And in that sense, you can already see that there's a very close relationship between the separation of the Fermi levels and the voltage, because the voltage also represents the amount of energy that each electron flowing through the external circuit provides to a consumer. And that takes us to this bottom equation here, which is fulfilled in pretty much every half-decent silicon solar cell. The separation of the Fermi levels that you can achieve in the absorber by absorption of light is a driver of the voltage and it is the upper limit of the terminal voltage that can be achieved. And that is important to remember, yeah? the, the relationship between voltage and the separation of the Fermi levels. Now, of course, if you're trying to make an actual solar cell, and again, these two diagrams here are taken from a paper by Peter Werfel and his son Uli, actually, and Andras Cuevas. Again, take a note, this is a very nice paper for you to read. Um, so here are just two band diagrams of a classic PN homojunction solar cell and a heterojunction solar cell on the right-hand side. I'm not going to talk about any detail about these two, two graphs. The main thing is that in both cases we have a relatively large absorber. In the case of the PN junction, it's actually a lot larger in this direction. As you know, it's about 200 micrometers thick and the, um, the junction area is only like a couple of microns. And so we have an absorber in which a separation of the quasi-Fermi levels is generated. And then in order to get a measurable ter terminal voltage and a, a structure to extract the current, we need to have some sort of asymmetry in the device, which has normally achieved by having areas with different um, conductances. In the PN junction, this is achieved by having P and N region in the PIN heterojunction by different contact regions uh, with different um, work, work functions. So while a device structure is needed to get extra currents and extra voltage, this, uh, this device structure is absolutely not needed to, to explain to you um, how the, the IV, ideal IV curve uh, is derived. And that's what we're, gonna, what we're gonna talk about now. So we understand what the voltage of a solar cell is. It's just the separation of the Fermi levels. So let's talk about the current. What happens in a solar cell in the dark when we, when we drive a current through it? 
essentially looking back at this diagram with an applied voltage we're injecting electrons here in the conduction band and we're extracting those electrons here from the valence band which is equivalent to injecting holes into the valence band at this point. So essentially the electron comes in here in the solar cell and it gets out here. So at some point within the solar cell the electron has to make a transition from the conduction band to the valence band. Yeah? So where does that happen? Does anyone know where that happens? Uh, no, no response. Many people think that this all happens at the junction, but that's not true. The electrons can make this transition anywhere in the device because the transition from the conduction band to the valence band is simply called recombination. As you all know, recombination happens anywhere in the device. We have bulk recombination, surface recombination, junction recombination, all kinds of recombination. Any recombination that happens contributes one electron hole pair flowing or one electron flowing through the circuit. And what that means is essentially that the total dark current is simply given by the total recombination current in your device. Yeah? Every current, every electron flowing through the current means one recombination event has to happen. So you can see here, this is a very simple equation for the dark current. It's simply the electron charge times the volume given by the thickness and the, the area times the total recombination rate per volume. And again, that recombination happens throughout the entire device volume. Now the question might be, we know the IV curve, the current depends on the voltage. So where is that voltage dependence hidden? Clearly the elementary charge, the thickness and the area are not voltage dependent. So it must be hidden in the dependence on the recombination rate on the voltage, or as we've learned before, the dependence on the of the recombination rate on the separation of the Fermi levels. Light current is pretty much the same thing, except that now we illuminate the solar cell. And for any photogenerated carriers, there are two potential outcomes. Either it can be extracted via the terminals or it can recombine within the solar cell. And the light current is simply given as the difference between generation rate and recombination rate. In other words, all photo electron hole pairs that are generated that uh, do not recombine have obviously been extracted via the external circuit. And again, generation rate, area, thickness and elementary charge are not voltage dependent. So the entire dependence of the IV curve on the voltage is hidden in the recombination rate. So let's have a look at recombination mechanisms. You've learned all this in your PV classes, I'm sure. Um, I like this picture with the, uh, the water bucket um, very much because I think it is a really nice analogy to a, a solar cell. So the bucket represents your solar cell absorber. You're filling it with water, which means you're creating electron hole pairs in that bucket by illumination with sunlight. So the water coming in represents the illumination. Um, the water level in that bucket represents the voltage of the device. We want the, more, the, the highest voltage possible. And you can see there's a tab, which is essentially the terminals where we can actually extract current or not. And of course, the higher the water level, the higher the pressure on the, the tap and the more water will come out with, 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 uh, with higher energy, basically. Yeah? So that's the analogy to the solar cell. Um, you can see there's also a bunch of holes in that bucket. And it's also clear to everyone that the more holes there are, the lower the water level will be. So each of these holes represents a recombination channel in your, in your device. And the more, of, the more of those we have, the lower the water level is going to be, the lower the voltage is going to be in our device. Yeah? And let's go through these um, um, recombination channels uh, for a few minutes. But the key is that there's only one recombination channel that you cannot avoid in any solar cell, and that is radiative recombination. Yeah? Because radiative recombination is the sort of reverse process of what we're actually trying to do in a solar cell. A solar cell absorbs light and creates um, electron hole pairs. And so for fundamental reasons, the inverse process where an electron hole pair disappears to create an emitted photon must also be, um, be possible. But that's the only one that is fundamentally unavoidable. There's a couple of material specific recombination me uh, mechanisms like intrinsic. These are uh, recombination mechanisms which are not avoidable for a specific material like silicon. For example, Auger recombination is one of them. It is fundamental and avoidable in principle but not for silicon. Um, and then there's the, inst the extrinsic ones, like defect recombination. You might have a silicon wafer which has a lot of iron in it, which causes extra uh, recombination. And that is one that we can actually avoid uh, via yeah, improved processing. And then there's a whole bunch of device-specific ones, junction recombination, surface recombination, contact recombination. And 
the process of patching all these holes, the process of avoiding all the or reducing all the avoidable recombination mechanisms, that's what all of you guys are working on here on a daily basis. Because that's the process of making a better solar cell. The key point here and take away from this slide though is that the only mechanism that cannot be avoided and the only one that we therefore need to be taking into account for a fundamental analysis of the IV curve is radiative recombination. So what have we learned so far? Oh, see, there we go. This is... Um, there you go. So the voltage of a good solar cell is, divide, is determined by the splitting of the Fermi levels. Uh, both the light and dark IV char characteristics and the current are completely determined by the total recombination throughout the device. And the total recombination is given by radiative recombination in an ideal case. So all we need to know in order to derive the IV curve is to find out how does radiative recombination determine, depend on the splitting of the Fermi levels. So this little sketch shows you what happens. Electrons and hole recombine, a photon is emitted, and because an electron and a hole are involved in that process, it's not hard to understand that the rate at which this happens is proportional to the electron concentration N and the hole concentration P. And the proportionality constant here is called the radiative recombination coefficient B. Now, if you've paid attention in your um, solar cell classes, then you would have learned that the NP product can be expressed in terms of the intrinsic carrier density Ni and this exponential term. So what you do is you express the electron concentration in terms of its quasi-Fermi distribution and the whole concentration in terms of their quasi-Fermi energy. Put it all together, you end up with this expression and this exponential term containing the separation of the Fermi levels. So what we've learned is that radiative recombination depends exponentially on the separation of the Fermi levels. Or in other words, the total recombination in the device determined it depends exponentially on the voltage of the device. And that sounds familiar because that's essentially what drives the IV curve of the solar cell. Before we continue, maybe I'll give you a bit of an idea what the luminescence from silicon actually looks like. Um, so this is a typical band-to-band -band luminescence spectrum from a silicon solar cell or a silicon wafer. Um, you can see the, the peak of the emission is at around 1140 nanometers and the entire spectrum is in the near-infrared uh, spectral region, so you can't see it, um, but of course you can detect it with spe specific infrared detectors. We distinguish PL and EL, photoluminescence and electroluminescence. Um, the emission spectrum, by the way, will look almost exactly the same or exactly the same for those two processes. They are just different in terms of how we generate those electron hole pairs that recombine in the first place. In the case of photoluminescence, the excitation is optical, which means we illuminate the semiconductor and create electron hole pairs via absorption of light. In EL, we're injecting current, which means we inject electron hole pairs, pairs into the device via the terminals. Um, the benefit of PL, of course, is that it's contactless and has a much wider range of applications. For, for EL, you need a finished device, so you can do that on finished cells or modules, but not on wafers, whereas PL has a much broader range of applications, which we're exploring in our group from silicon bricks, wafers, partially processed wafer cells, and now even complete modules. The key equation that describes luminescence is the so-called generalized Planck equation. And if you want to take away one equation from this, uh, from this presentation, remember this one. The generalized Planck law was initially derived in the 60s by Lescher and Stern, then expanded by von Rosebrook, and uh, later on by Peter Würfel in, in our group in Karlsruhe. They all made specific contributions. Peter actually showed that this, this, this equation is valid for indirect semiconductors, which is not trivial. Um, but again, it describes the total rate of light emission as a function of material parameters like the absorption coefficient of silicon and again, the separation of the Fermi levels. Now you can see here we have this minus one in the denominator. In pretty much all practical cases, um, in our experimental work, we can neglect this minus one. And then you can see we end up with this equ uh, equation here. And again, we have this exponential relationship between luminescence emission and the separation of the Fermi levels. Now this rate of spontaneous emission is a microscopic quantity. It tells you how many photons are emitted inside the volume of the semiconductor in a very tiny volume element. What we can measure externally is the emitted photon flux. So 
In order to get from the rate of spontaneous emission to the emitted photon flux, we need to do a relatively complex calculation which involves an integration of that rate of spontaneous emission over the entire device volume. We need to take into account a whole bunch of effects like reflection inside the semiconductor, the high refractive index leads to total internal reflection of a, uh, of a large percentage of that spontaneously emitted light, reabsorption, photon recycling and so on. And all these calculations can normally be done only um, uh, numerically using ray tracing and so forth. But there are a couple of special cases uh, for which we can derive very elegant analytical solutions and one of them is the perfect ideal absorber. So what's that? An ideal absorber is a material in which we sort of completely ignore what the, the geometry is, what the surfaces are. We just assume that above the band gap it is completely black, which means every photon that is hitting that material is completely absorbed, whereas for all wavelengths or all photon energies below, um, this should be h by omega smaller than eg here. So below the band gap, the, the absorptance is zero. So it's transparent below the band gap, completely absorbing above the band gap. And for that special case, we can actually calculate the total rate of um, emission. And you can see here, let's take the bottom equation. This is the rate of spontaneous emission. And in order to turn that into a recombination rate, we need to divide this rate per area by the thickness. And you can see then we get the total recombination rate inside the entire device volume as a function of the separation of the Fermi levels. And that is the final equation that we were after because it tells us how many electron hole pairs recombine in the material as a function of voltage. And that gives us the IV curve. So let's do that. Let's, um, let's calculate it. As if, yeah, going back to this one, the light IV curve is simply given by this equation. So if we replace the recombination rate in this equation, we get the light IV curve. And that's what we've done here. You can see here, this curve looks very familiar. This is the um, light IV curve that we've just derived, just based on the relationship of luminescence and its dependence on the separation of the Fermi levels. Yeah? And you see it's got all the common features that you already know about. We can define a short circuit current, we can define an open circuit voltage, we can define a maximum power point. And in this entire derivation, there was no need for assuming anything about a junction or anything like that. And the fact that this is actually uh, well, that this makes sense uh, is sort of confirmed because it's exactly that same principle and the same assumptions that are made in the calculation of limiting efficiency calculations. The sh so-called shockley quiser limit is exactly calculated like this, where you say the only recombination <coughs> mechanism is radi radiative recombination, and that leads to this exponential IV curve. Um, and you can then do that as a function of band cap and calculate what the upper limit for efficiency might be. So I think that's a nice takeaway um, and a, a, a nice sort of alternate uh, derivation of, of why the, the um, IV curve is exponential. Now the key point again, as I mentioned before, is that because luminescence has this exponential dependence on the separation of the Fermi levels, we can use it as a contactless probe for the voltage. Yeah? In many of our experiments, we completely ignore this term here, which describes how the luminescence depends on the emission <coughs> spectrum or the, the emission wavelengths. We just look at integral luminescence intensities and the only thing that depend, determines that is the separation of the Fermi levels or the, the implied voltage. So if we have suitable calibration methods, we can use absolute intensities and uh, in interpret them in terms of voltages. The nice thing about PL, as I said, is that it's applicable to fully processed cells and to wafers. And the other nice thing about PL, as we will see later, is that luminescence can be measured with cameras. So we can use highly resolved cameras to get pixel by pixel information about our device. And then we can use this relationship between the local intensity and uh, the voltage to, to interpret these images in terms of local voltages. So we've uh, gone to that, so I'll skip this slide. The question is, I've shown you that, you know, in principle you can get an IV curve from a uniform wafer and you don't need a junction for that, can this actually be measured? And the answer is yes. The answer comes from, uh, or this experimental demonstration comes from a combination of so-called SUNS PL and SUNS VOC uh, measurements. Sif, what's the time? Um, okay, so I will briefly explain what SUNS VOC is and what SUNS PL is. Um, 
In Sun's VOC measurements, you take a solar cell and you measure the open circuit voltage and then you use a light source and sweep the illumination intensity over a range of say 0.01 suns to 100 suns. And because the device is under open circuit conditions, all the electron hole pairs that you generate entirely recombine inside the device. But as we've learned before, the total recombination rate is a measure of the total current. So what you do is you plot the absorbed light intensity, which represents the current, over the measured voltage and that gives you a so-called implied IV curve. And this implied IV curve represents the actual IV curve very accurately, except for the effect of series resistances, because there is no, current, no actual current flowing over the terminals, so the effect of those uh, series resistances on the voltages are simply not there. But these techniques, Sun's VOC is, is used very heavily uh, in R&D, and it was used very heavily back in 2003, 2004, when we looked into this. So what we do in Sun's PL is very similar. We illuminate the sample with a wide range of illumination intensities, but now instead of measuring the actual terminal voltage with a, uh, with a multimeter, we just measure the PL intensity. And what I've told you before is the PL intensity can be interpreted as a voltage. So then we do the same thing as in uh, Sun's PL. We plot the implied current, which is the light intensity, as a function of the implied voltage, which we get from the PL. And here is the result. So here is a graph showing uh, two IV curves shown on a logarithmic scale. Um, so this is the incident light intensity representing the current and the black curve is the sun's VOC curve. You can see here we have a bit of a kink in that curve which we know, well we know what is causing that. <coughs> and then we've measured the sun's PL plotting the incident light intensity over the implied voltage from PL and you see we get very very nice agreement between these two curves over a wide range which means we can use a completely contactless technique photoluminescence to get information about the IV curve of this device. Now this measurement was done on a bifacial silicon solar cell because in order to prove this concept we wanted to have a scenario where we could actually compare the implied voltage from PL with the um, actual terminal voltage from a device and because our photo detector for the PL measurement was located on the rear of the solar cell back then, um, we had to use a bifacial solar cell. And yeah, you can see there's very nice agreement. The other thing that I want to emphasize is that due to the exponential nature between PL and voltage, this range of 300, 350 um, millivolts here on the x-axis corresponds to a PL intensity variation by more than seven orders of magnitude. Yeah? Because that's another rule of thumb you might want to remember, 10 times variation in PL signal corresponds roughly to a variation in voltage by 60 millivolts. Yeah, this slide just shows the exact same data but on a, lo on a linear scale. So this is yeah, the way you might be more familiar with in terms of looking at an IV curve. And you can see again very nice agreement, but you can also see there are some discrepancies here at uh, higher voltages. And back then, in 2004, 2005, when we did these experiments, we didn't quite understand what was going on there. Um, we did have this really nice agreement. You see the IV curve sort of bends over here at low voltages, where it, an ideal curve should really be a straight line. Um, with an n equals 1 behavior. The fact that it does bend over indicates that this cell is shunted and both the PL and the VOC data reflect that very nicely. We have this kink which we saw in both data but then we have these de deviations here at high intensities. So back then as I said we didn't understand and I, I'll talk about that in a minute. Now you might think okay if we can measure a voltage why do you do Sun's PL? This was just a proof of concept. The main benefit of PL is of course that we can do this on wafers where you can't measure the voltage. And so you can use this technique as a um, process monitor monitoring tool to get a quantitative IV curve for wafers which in principle don't even need a junction. And that's exactly what we've done here. Uh, we've taken a wafer, a partially processed solar cell, and we've measured this implied IV curve after two different process steps. And in this case here, the black and the blue line represent this implied IV curve of that wafer before and after a laser process was applied. And it turns out that this laser process, if done with the wrong laser parameters, causes severe shunting. And this is shown here in the blue curve. So we can quantify, with a contactless technique, the absolute impact of that process on the IV curve, which is uh, quite nice. Now back to this discrepancy here at high voltages. 
And again, we look at this PL image of a, let's say, perfect solar cell. You see that even in the perfect solar cell, we have local variations in the luminescence intensity, which we now know are representing local variations of the voltage. So we have a higher voltage here in the middle between the bus bars compared to the location at the bus bars. And that already shows you, in a way, what's going on here. The voltage that we measure at the terminals is lower than the average voltage across the device. And that is what's causing these um, discrepancies, which is something what we weren't really sort of fully on top of back then. But um, yeah, Robert, he's just arrived, has done a very nice study um, in which he has simulated these effects recently and published this in a paper earlier this year. So he used a program called Gridler, again something that I recommend you guys to use. It's a very nice 2D simulation package which you can use to make very accurate models of your solar cell structure with the grid fingers and everything. And that allows you to simulate um, the IV output but also the uh, luminescence image and so you're yeah, quite a, a powerful tool. So Robert used that to simulate the sun's VOC data shown here in blue and the sun's PL data shown in orange. So he causes his sun's IVOC because the sun's PL is basically a measurement of an implied voltage. And you can see he really nicely confirms or replicates the results that we found experimentally almost 10 years ago. Yeah. He's done similar experiments then on a different uh, types of devices. Uh, um, on the right hand side, a standard BSF solar cell, a PERC cell, and a, so -called a cell with so-called laser-fired contacts, in which you see a very interesting effect. We see actually that with increasing illumination intensity, the voltage actually starts uh, bending backwards. So you increase the line intensity and the voltage goes down, which is somewhat uh, unintuitive. In this case, it's caused by a, um, a Schottky diode on the rear surface at the, at the rear contacts. But key here is that this effect is present on every solar cell that you measure and there's uh, a bunch of things we can learn um, from, uh, from these discrepancies. So, so far we've talked about the relationship between luminescence and the voltage and now we're going to talk about the relationship between P PL and the excess minority carrier density. It's clear that the exponential of the separation of the Fermi levels can be expressed back into the NP product and the NP product can be written in terms of the doping density ND and the excess carrier density delta N, shown here. So what this tells us is that there's a quantitative relationship between the luminescence intensity and the excess minority carrier density, which in turn means that from the luminescence intensity we can get quantitative information about the excess minority carrier density, which of course is the basis of um, minority carrier lifetime measurements. Now one complication with PL measurements is that, as you can see from this equation, if we're in low injection, delta N is much smaller than the doping density, then the luminescence intensity is proportional to delta N. And that scenario is very similar to a QSSPC measurement where the extra photoconductance as you measure is also proportional to the delta N. But then in high injection, where delta N is much larger than the doping density, the, um, the PL signal starts transitioning to a quadratic behavior on um, on delta N, which complicates the analysis a little bit. So we have two different classic lifetime techniques now. One is the QSSPC and the other more recent one is PL. And PL essentially is ideal in terms of interpreting um, signals in terms of voltages because the signal is directly exponentially related to the voltage. For interpretation in terms of delta N, it's a bit more complicated we, because we do, we do need to know what the doping density is. For photoconductance measurements, it's exact other way around. The measurement is directly proportional to the excess carrier density and can therefore be very easily interpreted in terms of lifetime. However, if we're trying to interpret QSSPC data in terms of implied voltages, we do need to know the doping density. So these two techniques are actually nicely complementary to each other. But both PL and PC, that's the takeaway here, can be interpreted in terms of either delta N or implied voltages. So there's two different ways lifetime measurements can be done. And that, uh, those two fundamentally different ways uh, stem from the um, continuity equation, which is shown here. So the solution to this equation is that the lifetime is given by this expression here, which contains the excess minority carrier density, the generation rate, and the derivative of the excess minority carrier density with time. And there are two extreme cases that we can uh, analyze here. Well, there's first of all the, gen the general case, which is expressed by this equation. Then there's the steady state case, where 
any variations in the material are very, very slow. We use a very slowly varying excitation pulse. And that means the any time dependent signals are negligible. And then you can see this equation for the lifetime simplifies to just the excess carrier density divided by the generation rate. And then there's the transient case in which we turn off the light, which means the generation rate is zero, in which case the lifetime is given by this expression here. And this is nice because in this case, the um, lifetime can relatively easily be determined just from the slope of the free transient decay. And that's the same principle in QSSPC and QSSPL. All we need to do is we need to find a way to get delta N from the measured signal, and then we can apply uh, either transient or steady state techniques to either PL or uh, PC data. So that's what we started in 2003. Robert Bardos and I, we started setting up the first QSSPL lifetime system here at UNSW. And what we showed is that for some samples, we found excellent, excellent agreement between the lifetime from photoluminescence and the lifetime from photoconductance. Yeah? This is a double-side passivated sample without a junction, and the agreement is really uh, quite stunning. But then we saw, we saw some severe discrepancies for certain samples. This is a double-side passivated sample with a diffuse PN junction. And you can see that the, the measured lifetime from the photoconductance data kicks up very sharply here at carry densities below 10 to the 13. And that is an experimental artifact, which back then was uh, described by various authors. Um, and it was called the so-called uh, depletion region modulation effect. And what we were able to show is that while we get, again, relatively nice agreement here at high injection, the PL, and the PL lifetime data are completely unaffected by this effect. And by now, there's been a whole bunch of experimental artifacts which lead to several result, uh, similar results in the, um, in the PC data. Minority carrier trapping is one, the DRM effects the other, and there's a whole bunch of others. And PL has been shown to be highly, highly resilient to all these artifacts. So PL has a definite advantage for lifetime measurements at low to immediate, intermediate injection levels. Now, calibration of PL data is, to be quite honest, a lot more challenging than in photoconductance data. Many of you might have used a Sinton QSSPC system, and you know the system's calibrated, you chuck a wafer on there, and you get a lifetime out. You don't have to worry too much about calibration. That's not the case in PL, because in photoluminescence, the calibration of the measured signal into, um, into lifetime depends on the sample properties itself. It depends, as I said, on the doping, but it also depends on the optical properties of the sample, the texture, the AR coatings, and so forth. <coughs> So calibration is a bit more complicated, and over the years, um, a whole range of different calibration techniques have been developed. One, is, one idea is to actually find one calibration point by comparing PL and PC data, and that's what we often do here in a combined system which has both PL and PC integrated. Another one is actually to calibrate implied voltages from PL against measured voltages. That's what we've done in that uh, SUNS PL, SUNS VOC um, experiment. And then there's a, a wide range of so-called dynamic calibration approaches. And I want to show you one that we have developed, which is called the self-consistent calibration. So this is how it works. Um, again, here we have the general expression for the lifetime as a function of generation rate and excess carry density. And when we excite the sample with a relatively slowly varying light pulse, which is too slow to be in transient, but too fast to be in truly steady state conditions, then you can see that we have a very, very tiny slight phase shift between the generation rate and the minority carrier density. I hope you can see it here. The red line representing delta N is slightly phase shifted relative to the generation rate. And what that means is that our illumination pulse is a little bit too fast to be in true steady state, because if it was in true steady state, you would get the two curves lying on top of each other. Um, what that means is that in a lifetime measurement, each injection level is measured twice, once on the rising branch of this light pulse and once on the falling branch of that light pulse. And it turns out that if your calibration of your PL system is not correct, then the lifetime you get on the rising branch or on the falling branch will be different. And that is expressed here by this factor AI where AI equals one re represents, this is simulation data, uh, 
it represents the the um, the dotted lines of simulation data. It, it, it represents the accurate calibration of the system. And then you can see here that if we have a 10%, 5% and 20% discrepancy in our calibration constant, that then we get severe deviations between the two lifetimes in the rising and the falling branch. So this enables us to, to use this as a very nice elegant method to find the right calibration experimentally. All you do is you do your measurement, do your light pulse, and then you adjust your calibration until the, until the two sort of branches fall on top of each other. And in effect, uh, this reduction of hysteresis effects in the lifetime data is, is effectively um, an implicit comparison of uh, quasi-steady state and transient measurements in one, in one run. <coughs> okay, let's talk about luminescence imaging now. Um, as Ziv said, luminescence imaging was de developed here in our group around 2004-2005, first publication in 2006. Um, what we do is we used, back then we used a high power laser and some special optics to illuminate um, the entire sample uniformly. And then we use a scientific grade CCD camera, which is sensitive in the near infrared region, and just, just take a photograph of the luminescing sample. The benefit of that is uh, that you get a highly spatially resolved image with a very short measurement time, typically on the order of one second or less. But in practice it is a little more difficult than uh, and this sounds because the luminescence efficiency, for example, of raw wafers can be on the order 10 to the minus 8, 10 to the minus 9, which means that any reflected laser light that you get from the surface can be 8, 9 or 10 orders of magnitude more intense than the signal that you're trying to measure. So you have to have very sophisticated um, filtering arrangements uh, to get um, artifact-free images. But of course the benefit is uh, substantial and this measurement principle has been adopted since then very rapidly. Um, when we introduced this here at the center, after a couple of months really, everyone working on silicon solar cells started using it on a daily basis and then shortly thereafter, you know, we started forming the company and, and it was fairly rapidly, um, yeah, became a, a standard characterization tool in, in the R&D community and also in the industry. So I want to just show you two examples of how we can use luminescence imaging and in the previous part of the presentation I've talked about the relationship between intensity, luminescence intensity and voltage and on the other hand between luminescence intensity and excess carrier density and based on the imaging principle there is now a very very large range of applications, quantitative analysis methods and there is not enough time today to talk about all those that might be subject of a presentation for another day. But two, uh, two examples for how we use imaging and the local luminescence intensity in terms of voltage and delta N. So this is uh, a slide set from experimental data from something like 2007. So what we've done here is we've taken a silicon solar cell, again an older style two bus bus cell. You can see here that the cell is actually located in a normal um, IV measurement chuck. So it's got a, a, a bar of uh, spring-loaded pins. So the cell is contacted. And what we've done is we've taken photoluminescence images with constant uh, illumination across the device. And then we've started extracting more and more current from the device. And the actual operating point of the cell is shown here uh, by this little um, circle. So you can see that the first image is shown here for open circuit conditions. So let's have a look what happens when we start increasing more and more current and the actual current extract is shown here at the top. So you see as the current that we extract is increasing the luminescence image actually changes quite rapidly. And that was something that we didn't expect initially. Yeah? So now at the end we're at the maximum power point where we're extracting about 95 percent of the current and you see quite unusual patterns emerge in the cell. And this is, without going too much further, this is related to serious resistance effects in the cell. So we realize that if you have an area in the solar cell that due to firing problems or whatever has a higher serious resistance, the extraction, of, the extraction of current from that region is not as efficient as it should be, which means that these areas remain at a higher carry density or at a higher implied voltage. And that means they, ha they have higher luminescence intensity. So all the areas in this image which have high luminescence intensity 
indicate problems with, with serious resistance. Now initially we thought, oh, this is great, we can do this for qualitative serious resistance measurements, but we then uh, <coughs> investigated this further and developed this into a range of quantitative serious resistance imaging techniques. Before we go into those, I want to emphasize one thing. If we went further with this and went all the way to short circuit, most of this area would still not uh, go to zero. And what's even more interesting, even the normal regions of the cell, the luminescence does not go to zero which was also unexpected because, as I told you before, there's an exponential relationship between luminescence and, um, and voltage. So if we go to zero voltage, the luminescence should also be zero. But it wasn't. And that effect is related to voltage-independent carriers, and I'm not sure we're going to have time to talk about that at the end. Uh, maybe we do. So as I said, uh, Henna Kampert and several others in our group then developed a bunch of quantitative serious resistance techniques and these are all based on the idea of using different luminescence images. For instance, you could use a first luminescence image under open circuit conditions as I've shown you on the last slide. That gives you information about recombination properties of the device and then you take a bunch of measurements with different current extractions and from a quantitative analysis of this we can then completely separate the serious resistance effects from the recombination effect. So these two images here show you half of a normal screen printed cell. On the left hand side you see the normal VOC image and all the normal um, features, dislocations, scratches, uh, grain boundaries and so forth. And on the right hand side you see the serious resistance image that Henna has um, calculated for that cell in absolute units of ohm centimeter squared. In this case this is a cell that in itself doesn't have many uh, specific serious resistance features but what you can see is that our uh, measurement chuck actually was not ideal because there's a bunch of spring-loaded pins and this central pin is actually not carrying current it is just measured to use to measure uh, the voltage of the device and you can see that due to this non-uniform contacting of the device we actually introduced an artificial series resistance effect because the current that is extracted from these regions here must actually flow laterally to get to this pin yeah? so that eff effectively uh, represents a higher effective series resistance. So that technique, serious resistance imaging, is now implemented in our tools and it's quite widely used and it's fair to say that it has displaced uh, the existing techniques for measuring serious resistance quite rapidly. The one was called core scan, where you actually had to scratch a needle across the surface of the device to measure the local voltage and thereby you measured a serious resistance image but your cell in the end was uh, destroyed and the whole process took like several hours. Our technique takes a couple of seconds and is non-destructive uh, non and um, yeah, far higher spatial resolution. So yeah, one of the applications that has been really, really successful. Here's another example. Again, a serious resistance image taken on a screen printed solar cell, which had problems with the firing. Here you can see there's this weird pattern, which is actually the pattern of the, um, the belt in the firing furnace. And you can see how temperature variations in the wafer due to contact to the belt furnace or possibly shading from the belt in illumination. We don't know exactly cause problems with, with, with the firing and therefore these extreme variations in the serious resistance. And you can imagine that having yeah, such spatially resolved information gives you very um, easy to interpret clues as to what is going wrong in your process. The last example is now how we use the relationship between local, illumination inte local luminescence intensity and um, excess carry density. We've seen that that relationship can be used to interpret luminescence data in terms of minority carrier lifetime. And that was in fact the first application that we published in 2006 together with the um, Fraunhofer Easy guys. This is a PL image on a multi-crystalline passivated silicon wafer. And here we used a calibration approach, our self-consistent calibration, to calibrate the absolute luminescence intensity into absolute minority carrier lifetime. And you see the scale bar here represents the lifetime in microseconds. And you can see there's quite a range of variations from 0 to 180 microseconds in this specific wafer. And that lifetime variation was confirmed by comparison with a bunch of other um, techniques available at the time. But again, with the benefit of a vastly superior spatial resolution and shorter measurement times. Now, these PL images are performed normally under steady state conditions. So you illuminate the entire wafer uniformly with the laser and then you measure the image while the illumination is on. So this is true steady state conditions. And one of the, the shortcomings of that techniques is that because you have a uniform generation rate, 
but a locally varying lifetime based on this relationship between lifetime and generation rate. Generation is constant, lifetime is variable, the injection level is also variable. I mean, that's what you see in the image. Yeah? The image shows you the vari variation in injection level or in, in excess carry density. Lifetime measurements are normally done at a constant injection level. So what we would like to have is a approach where we can have um, a uniform injection level. Because the other problem with this approach is that if you have locally variable lifetime, due to this variation in excess carry density, you, could lateral, you get lateral balancing currents. Carriers flow from areas of high carrier concentration to areas of low carrier uh, concentration, and that smears out the contrast. The contrast. So this is a, a little shortcoming of this technique, but we're currently working on a technique in our PL group. Uh, uh, Jan, he's not here, I think, um, is working on that, where we, yeah, we, we tried to get get around this problem with a, a new uh, light source, which is allows spatially non-uniform generation rate, where we then get uh, constant excess care density and the lifetime is related to the inverse of the generation rate. Okay, uh, what, what's the time? We have 20, 20 minutes. Okay, so that gives me time to talk about the role of voltage independent carriers. Um, this is a somewhat esoteric topic, uh, so if you don't follow this, don't worry about it too much. Um, but we have seen that in all the experimental methods that we have talked about, QSSPL, SUNSPL, or even QSSPC, the measured signal always represents an average of the excess carrier density across the device thickness. Yeah? So the question is whether the implied voltage that we derive from such an average excess carrier density is an actual, actual accurate measure of the cell voltage, which is determined by the um, Fermi level split at the junction. And the answer is no unfortunately. As I've told you before, from the relationship between luminescence and implied voltage, we expect the luminescence signal at short circuit conditions to be zero. But in our series resistance images, we've seen that it is not. When we go to short circuit conditions in an illuminated solar cell, the luminescence intensity drops quite dramatically, as we've seen, typically to 5% of the value at open circuit, but it's not zero. So it's small, but not zero. And so we, we didn't understand that initially, um, but shortly after uh, Malcolm Abbott investigated this and he identified this to be due to so-called um, diffusion-limited carriers, which Matthias Juhl then later expanded, and he is now referring to this um, effect as voltage-independent carriers. So let me explain to you what this is all about. So the following shows PC1D simulations that Matthias has done as part of his PhD and recently published. So here we see the excess carrier density in a normal solar cell as a function of the distance from the front, front surface. And the black curve here represents the excess carrier density for an applied voltage in the dark. So we're applying a voltage of 625 millivolts. And you can see that we have a slight uh, variation here in the excess carrier density, which is higher at the front and a little bit lower at the back. Then Matthias went on to simulate what happens in the same solar cell under illumination and under open circuit conditions. So the illumination wavelength here is 1100 nanometers and he has chosen the illumination intensity so that the resulting open circuit voltage is the same 625 millivolts as what we assumed in the simulation of the EL data. And you can see that if that is the case, not surprisingly, the excess carrier density at the front at the junction is actually the same. That basically says the same actual diode voltage is present. But you can also see that there's different carrier density throughout the volume of the device. There's higher excess carrier density towards the rear than in, in, the, in the illuminated case compared to the applied voltage case. The next simulation that um, Matthias has done Again, illumination with 1100 nanometers with the same illumination intensity, but now he's simulated the solar cell to be under short circuit conditions. And that's the blue curve. And you can see our simulations quite clearly show that there are excess, carrier, excess carriers in the device, despite the fact that the voltage is zero. And it is those carriers which are the diffusion limited, or as Matthias called them, voltage independent carriers. And you can see why he calls them voltage independent carriers, because they are present in the device under illumination, 
regardless of what the voltage is. You can see that this is true because it is exactly that same profile here that represents the difference between the open circuit illuminated case and the electroluminescence case. Let me show you that. The symbols here, the triangles, represent the sum of the blue curve and the black curve. So you can see that this excess carrier density that is present under short circuit conditions under illumination is present at any voltage in the device and it's completely independent of the voltage. It just adds to the, to the carrier density that you get when you apply a voltage. And what that means is that our excess carrier density in, PL, in a PL situation is always given as the excess carrier density that you have with an applied voltage in the dark plus an extra term due to these voltage independent carriers. So a corrected PL intensity that is related to the actual device voltage needs to be the PL intensity under open circuit conditions minus the PL intensity under short circuit conditions. Back then when we did our um, series resistance approach, imaging approach, the first one, we sort of guessed that it would be the case and we actually published it in, in that sense. We said every voltage, every PL image needs to be corrected for a short circuit image without understanding really what we were doing. Um, and now we have a much clearer quantitative understanding of what's going on. Now here, this simulation was done with relatively long wavelength excitation. Matthias has also simulated um, what happens with shorter wavelength excitation. Here, 750 nanometers. And you can see here, all excess carrier density profiles are ex essentially the same and the um, concentration of voltage independent carriers is almost zero. And this is because with short wavelength excitation, the carriers are generated very close to the front and in that case, that scenario very, very closely resembles the scenario when you inject the carriers at the front. There's no difference. There's no carrier generation further away from the junction and therefore uh, no vo voltage independent carrier distribution throughout the bulk. Matthias has also shown that you can actually quantitatively derive this in an analytical fashion. So if we look at the um, continuity equation, uh, there's a general solution for that continuity equation shown here. Um, and Matthias has shown that this solution can be split up into a voltage dependent and into a voltage independent term given here. So you can see the voltage dependent term has all these constants and exponential terms plus an expo exponential relationship and the voltage. This is what we expect. But then there's this voltage independent term which is completely independent of the voltage which is only dependent on the um, illumination intensity and then the illumination wavelength. And that voltage independent carrier term has quite significant implications for experiments that uh, Matthias has carried out. So what Matthias has done here is he has tried to use luminescence as a contactless way of measuring the quantum efficiency of solar cells and quantum efficiency of wafers. The idea is that we should be able to get quantum efficiency information on samples before they're processed into a finished cell and thereby once again we have the ability to quantify the impact of individual processing steps on the QE um, more accurately. But what Ma Matthias has found, and so what, what the way that works is you measure the luminescence intensity from a device and then you vary the excitation wavelengths. So you look at how the luminescence intensity actually changes as a function of excitation wavelengths across this wavelength range here. And what Matthias found is that here the red curve that for certain device parameters, when you have a high surface recombination velocity, for example, you get this extreme hump in the, um, in the near infrared region, which causes artifacts in the EQE. And it is that effect um, which is caused by the voltage independent carriers. And what he found is that this effect is completely negligible for all wavelengths less than 600 nanometers, and that it's also um, mostly irrelevant for, for wafers with low surface recombination and high uh, effective lifetime. So in principle what he showed is that the measurement works quite well on many practical um, practical samples and as I said before this whole voltage independent carrier um, effect is very relevant for series resistance imaging uh, applications. So let me summarize uh, again some key takeaways. Um, luminescence or radiative recombination represents the only fundamentally unavoidable recombination mechanisms. 
The dependence of the luminescence intensity on delta N enables PL-based minority care lifetime measurements and minority care lifetime imaging. Um, the exponential dependence of the luminescence on the quasi-Fermi level uh, separation is the main cause for the exponential relationship between current and voltage in a real device. And as we know, there's other recombination channels in a real device, but they all have a similar exponential relationship between the recombination rate and the separation of the Fermi levels. Um, I've told you that luminescence intensity are a very nice, uh, elegant way to measure implied voltages in a contactless fashion. And I've also shown you that the uh, voltage independent carriers are present in silicon solar cells under long wavelength illumination and must be corrected for. Now, of course, there's a lot more to EL and PL, and there would be uh, a lot of space for uh, additional talks. There's time resolved luminescence, uh, we're looking at spectrally resolved luminescence, PL with variable illumination, variable illumination lengths. ZIF is doing a lot of work on temperature dependent luminescence and what we can learn from that. Um, of course, the whole area of imaging and mapping defect luminescence is uh, an interesting topic where we look at the emission of uh, luminescence below the band gap energy. Um, and all this can be applied to a wide range of samples, bricks, wafers, cells and modules, uh, which we're doing here. And then, of course, you can, can combine all these things with each other. So there's a wide range of applications that we're looking at in the PL group. But these are topics for another day. I want to conclude uh, yeah, by thanking my research group here. There's a bunch of really good students and postdocs. We're having a lot of fun. We currently have a, a, an, an ARENA-funded project, and these two pictures are sort of photos from uh, project meetings that we've had in the Blue Mountains here at the top left and uh, down at the south coast, organized by our colleagues from ANU. Um, and all this is funded by ARENA, and ARENA has recently given us uh, the green lights on some more funding for the next three and a half years, so there's a lot more to come. So if you're interested in the, some of the work we're doing, potentially interested in doing a PhD or something like that, uh, let us know. Um, yeah, and with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. How far has um, it been developed to extract EQE from PL <coughs> measurements? You know, are there any tools available for doing that? Uh, there's no commercial tools yet, but uh, Matthias has uh, done a good job on this, and there's uh, another student now, Apu, um, who's continuing that work. Um, there's, as I said, there's a couple of uh, complications with, uh, with PL. Um, the voltage-independent carriers are, is one. We've recently identified there's also uh, similar problems in the short wavelength range. There's a, another bunch of voltage independent carriers on the other side of the junction. So if you illuminate with very short light, uh, a lot of carriers are generated on the sunny side of the junction and there's essentially the same effect with voltage independent carriers. There can also be complications from uh, um, sp spurious sources of luminescence. Imagine you illuminate a solar cell with blue light. There can be light for luminescence response from the nitride, for example. And that nitride luminescence has nothing to do with uh, what we're actually trying to measure. So there's a couple of complications, but they're all under control and we're about to characterize those. And we're also working at the moment on a very nice experimental method to completely circumvent uh, these problems. But that is not published yet. And uh, so there's uh, a lot more to come. And I would think that in the next two years, some commercial products should be potentially on the market to, um, to use those. Um, could the technique be applied to multi-junction cells like the standard commercial triple junction cells? It's quite tricky to measure their EQE. There's, um, you know, bias light effects you've got to do and you've got to do corrections. Yeah. Could it be applied to that more easily? That they're, they're um, Absolutely. at least the top two junctions are direct cap materials, 3-5 yeah. materials, mm. but um, yeah. No, absolutely. And there's, I know there's papers from uh, Fraunhofer Group, I think, where they've done exactly that. They've so this, this analysis here where you anal analyze the luminescence intensity in terms of a voltage, that's exactly what they've done for a 3-5 cell. So they illuminate with different uh, excitation wavelength and then they look at the photoluminescence response from the different layers, which they can of course separate because the emission occurs in different spectral regions. 
and then they quantify each luminescent spectrum in terms of a voltage. So yeah, uh, for the for the sort of devices, the two terminal devices where you do not measure the the voltage on each individual subcell, this is a very powerful yeah. technique. Uh, they can get the sub. They're trying to get the subcell, the yes. individual subcell voltages. Yes. But could, do you think you could get the actual individual subcell EQEs? In principle, yes. Yeah. yeah. So. Okay. Of course, within certain spectral ranges only. I mean, uh, you're not going to get the uh, the EQE in the blue for the for the bottom cell, for example. You know, but uh, that's not so so interesting anyway. So for the PL tool that we have in SURF, like you mentioned, we have like quite a few options to do. But can we do like? Uh, Apart from the open circuit PL, can we do like Sun's PL and all those things on wafers? Uh, some of it, is, I'm not sure, sure about the Sun's PL option. It is an option. Uh, no, Sun's PL is not integrated on that tool. But for instance, the series resistance imaging is uh, is implemented on that tool. And as I said, this this is just a very very small snapshot of all the various applications. There was a student here, Chao Shen, who is now working for our company, who has developed a whole suite of advanced um, cell analysis methods where you can get J0 images, efficiency images, serious resistance images, and um, these should be, in, I, I'm sure these are actually installed on the on the tool in SURF. Uh, some of them are, but like, what exactly can we use for, no, like for the wafers? Can we use all of them for the wafers or we need fi finished cells for them? Well, those specific ones, of course, are for finished cells. Serious resistance imaging is, is something that you inherently can only do on a finished cell. Um, but, of course, since qu quantitative lifetime uh, imaging is, is one of the things you can do on that tool. The calibration in that case is not using our um, self-consistent calibration that I talked about, but it's actually using a built-in QSSPC system. So you get an absolute lifetime from the QSSPC, as you normally do, which is an average lifetime across the uh, the coil area, and uh, then that is that value is used to calibrate the entire image. And for that, also, do we need like the six-inch wafers, or we I can use the small tokens? No, you can do smaller tokens. They have to be large enough to at least fill the the coil uh, the coil area, but it can be done with a smaller token. But if you're interested in Sun's PL, for example, so you can just contact us. Robert, for example, is our expert for Sun's PL measurement. Yeah, that's actually a good point. Um, as I said, so calibration issues is, is not trivial in, in PL, and so for some of these more advanced uh, analysis methods, which I think are very useful and very powerful, uh, it's probably a good idea to talk to Ziff or yeah, anyone from the PL team. And there's the QSS PL in one tool. Yeah. There's a, a QSS PL system, the long term one tool. Oh, okay. If you have a bunch of samples just w for a one-off, I'm sure you, they can help you. And if, if you d it's something you want to do more regularly, then you can be trained on it and do it yourself. Yeah, I would really like to. Other questions? So we have a bit of time, Torsten, and we focus, you focus mainly on silicon, because that's our expertise. Uh, but there is people here that are not silicon, like Matthew for Ghani. Any comments on for non-silicon material or? Yeah, well, well, one comment is uh, if we can do it on silicon, we should be able to, to do it on most other um, solar cell materials because silicon is actually uh, not the ideal material for luminescence measurements. It's an indirect band gap material, so it has generally very low luminescence quantum efficiency. So if you try to do uh, luminescence analysis on three fives or any direct material, it should be a lot easier. Um, and we have actually shown in, in previous publications that the same principles, this correlation of luminescence intensity and the separation of the Fermi levels, it translates to exactly the same way to, to other types of cell concepts. I've done it in my PhD thesis years, uh, 15 years ago, on so-called um, dye solar cells. Aman has done some work on uh, perovskite solar cells, and we've shown that, yeah, the same principles apply. So I would, I would say that... Um, Generally, luminescence is due to these fundamental relationships an ideal characterization tool for any PV material. Oliver, I've got a question to ask. <coughs> I think, I still think it's kind of a miracle that we're detecting 
PL with a silicon camera yeah. that actually has very low absorption in the range where the PL emits. Maybe you can talk a sentence or two about those difficulties and, and, yeah. and what they mean for PL measurements because we're imaging so, so generally we're getting very low sort of amounts of photons and then we are measuring with a very non-ideal configuration and still it's possible. I think it's kind of a miracle. Yes. Where was the spectrum? Where is it? Ah, here. Yeah, and in a sense, that is probably has been a good thing for us because people always assume silicon <coughs> is not a useful uh, luminescence is not a useful technique to characterize silicon because it is such a poor light emitter. So the, all the experimental difficulties in terms of, in, in measuring luminescence were probably considered a, an obstacle in, in terms of developing imaging techniques. But it turns out that with a with a modern CCD camera, the signal is actually rather strong. Um, you're right, the spectrum is actually going here. You see this is luminescence spectrum, starts at 900, going all the way to 1250. And when we use a silicon detector, the absorption normally drops off around here. So what we detect is with a silicon camera is only that tiny little short wavelength tail from the, from the luminescence emission. But it turns out it is enough um, to get high, yeah, high resolution images within very short measurement times. People now use INGAS cameras, which have a spectral sensitivity across the entire spectral range, but um, they have other disadvantages. So these detectors capture all this long wave uh, emission, but long wave emission means the light also has a lot of ability to bounce inside the sample, which washes out the contrast between high and low lifetime regions. So imagine you have a very sharp contrast in your actual lifetime, high luminescence intensity from this region and low luminescence from this region, but the, 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 the wave is textured, so the luminescence that's coming from the high intensity region can actually travel laterally inside the wafer and then come out um, at a completely different location. And that is what you get very sensitive to when you measure with an, an, an ingas detector, whereas the, um, the silicon detector inherently only measures the short wavelength light, which, which cannot travel so far inside the silicon. So we see significant benefits in using uh, silicon detectors over, um, um, over ingas. Is that? Yeah. I'm, I'm still thinking because we are, we are measuring spatially resolved signals, so we are measuring signals from very small areas, which then inherently means there's very small signals. We are measuring with a camera, with camera which is very non-ideal in its absorption problem. I, I still think it's kind of a miracle. But as you said, people didn't expect that to be possible. And, and you've shown, of course, with your work that it, it's, it works very well which probably has to do with the camera technology that is just really, really good. Well, we started, as you know, we started with non-imaging non applications. All this QSSPL work was around 2003, 2004. And back then, I didn't say that here, but in, in the context of these, uh, these measurements, um, where are they here? You can see that on this sample here, the PL data we were able to measure lifetime down to excess minority carrier densities of 10 to the 9, in some cases 10 to the 8. And if you've ever measured QSSPC, you will struggle to get decent lifetimes at 10 to the 12, 10 to the 11. So we were able to show in that earlier work that the luminescence intensity is obviously strong enough, detected with a silicon detector, um, to, to detect very, very small excess minority carrier densities on the order 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. So orders of magnitude more sensitive than than any other technique. And that sort of pointed us in the direction that while it is an indirect semiconductor and the, the efficiency is low, the absolute rates are still very high because illumination intensities and, and, and currents that you inject are, are very high. So it, it's not so much about the relative, it's about the absolute intensities. You showed a really good example with the um, firing on the belt furnace, and it mm. showed the belt furnace um, pattern. Yep. Um, have you got other examples of where the technique has been really um, important in solving problems? Oh, yeah, an infinite number, I'd say. Okay. Uh, one nice one, actually, is, is um, you might remember Cast Mono. That was a hype a couple of years ago, 
the way that Chinese manufacturers do it, it's, it's someone works on a new technology, all of, all of a sudden everyone works on it. It's a bit like that with shingle uh, modules at the moment. Everyone seems to be working on shingles. And back then, um, multi-crystalline wafers, one of the biggest problems with multi-crystalline wafers was that they were full of uh, um, dislocations and full of grain boundaries. And what people assumed that is in order to make a better solar cell, you needed to get rid of the grain boundaries and make uniform monocrystalline wafers. And the, uh, uh, but CZ pulling was too expensive, so that they said, can we make cast monocrystalline wafers? That was done using seeding. And what they didn't realize is by, by doing that, by casting monocrystalline wafers, extreme stress built up in the crucible that led to all kinds of dislocations. The wafers from the bottom of the crucible were quite nice, and they made nice efficiency solar cells, but at the top, the luminescence images showed they were pretty much black, full of dislocation networks which is something that you would not have been able to see very easily or find out very easily. But with luminescence images, we got, in the early days of cast mono development, um, Suntech was working on it back then, and we had a good relationship with them. So sa they sent us wafers from an entire ingot, from bottom to top. We imaged each one of them, and we have a little movie. I don't have it here now, but it's a movie, and you can see clean luminescence images from the bottom, and then as you go to the top, it blooms, and the entire wafer gets dark, uh, full of dislocations, and the guy, uh, Professor Wan from Taiwan University, he is one of the key people who developed cast mono. He told me, we could not have done this development without your PL technology because that told us where the problems are and that helped us rapidly improve it. It never made it into mass manufacturing, but it is actually seeing a bit of a revival at the moment. But that is a nice example, you know, to get a feedback from a professor to say, you know, your technique has really, that was the key for us to develop uh, uh, this technology and, and, uh, and drive it forward. And this is just one. I mean, if you, if you look what happened here at, um, at UNSW in the early days, Jeff Cotter was running the Buried Contact Solar Cell Group back then. And when we started PL Imaging, every day one of his students came to our lab, took a PL image of their wave and said, he said, oh my God, what is this? All kinds of problems, tweezers marks, um, non-uniform of belt furnaces, non-uniformity of diffusion furnaces in terms of temperature profiles. And every time they look at the image and they say, okay, now I know what this is. And Jeff said, normally it would have taken us years and years and years to figure these problems out. Yeah? So, and that's still the case. With, with any new device concept that, there, that is developed, you look at, at the images and it, it helps you figure, figure these pro problems out more clearly and more quickly.